and we're oh, it's disconnected. That's perfect. So I'm going to stop sharing now and I'm going to hand you over. Now, our first speaker this evening is David Bevan, and he's going to start off showing you some of his. We, we've had a sneak preview and he's got some lovely sides to share with us. So, David, when you're ready, um, if you can click on share screen and we'll start with your presentation. Are you okay there? Right. And then, yep, it's yeah. coming up. Perfect. Okay. Um, Lovely. Hopefully my audio is okay. Uh, I'm not too bothered about the, the visual, but uh, hopefully the audio is all right. Yeah, my presentation is a slight cheat because I didn't actually take very many photographs last uh, year. So instead, what I'm going to show you is uh, an account of two little surveys that I carried out um, with regard to the Parkland Walk. That's the old railway line that runs between Finsbury Park and Alexandra Palace via Highgate. The first of those surveys I did a long time ago in, in 1982. And I thought it would be interesting to see uh, how uh, the flora has changed over time. Um, so the first few pictures are going to be uh, pictures of the early days of the uh, railway line. And this photograph was taken, or I, I'm going to pretend it was taken in 1971, when the railway tracks were actually taken up. The, the Parkland Walk closed as a, as, as a passenger train in 1954, but they kept the rails open until 1971. And one of the plants that is particularly associated with railway lines is the Oxford ragwort. But this is not Oxford ragwort. This is rather more special. This is one of the very, very few plants that I know of that's actually named after London. This is Senecio londinensis, the London groundwort, I call it, because it's a hybrid. It's a hybrid between the Oxford ragwort, which I think you can see uh, uh, images of at the top there, and the sticky groundsel. You put those two together, you get the London groundwort, which I think uh, was um, uh, 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 a name that um, came to me uh, a few moments ago. Here we go. We should now have the next picture, but uh, yes, here we go. That's a, that, that's a close up of the London groundwort. Uh, I think you, you can see the uh, uh, star like flowers uh, of, of the Oxford ragwort there. And what you can't see, and you'll have to take my word for it, is that it's covered in little sticky hairs. So it has characteristics of both those plants. And, um, and that was common on the Parkton Walk back in the 1980s when I first started doing my survey work. Um, the second survey I carried out quite recently in, in uh, 2015, uh, and this photograph shows what the old railway has evolved into, if you like. And this is a, br a, a, a bridge abutment um, at near Crouch, Crouch End. And you can see one of the uh, dominant plants on the walk, which is the Buddleia. Uh, and you can also see a little bit of one of the parents of the plant I've just been talking about, which is the Oxford Rag. So Oxford Ragwort, Buddleia, two introduced plants, um, which we'll say a little bit about uh, in, in, in a moment. So the Parkland Walk consists of embankments and cuttings. And the embankments in particular uh, have remained uh, particularly rich uh, in, in plants. Um, you can see in the distance the way the trees are advancing down the embankment. But when I first started my survey in 1982, it was this open area that I was particularly interested in. And the plants that were occurring there in some numbers were plants that were able to fix nitrogen from the uh, 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 soil because they had little bacteria in their roots. Uh, and this is the, the has foot clover. That plant survived until uh, 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 really quite some time ago. It, it couldn't cope with the um, a competition that uh, followed it. So these little clovers uh, didn't survive for very long and they disappear and are not found in the second survey that I carried out. This is the zigzag clover, which has this one of the bright uh, red coloring. That was sort of actually on that same embankment as we've just seen. And birdsfoot trefoil, a very favorite plant of many of us, um, 
the uh, bacon and eggs uh, uh, is, is its other name. And it is, of course, an important food plant for the common blue. And sadly, that plant also uh, was there because it was able to fix nitrogen and grow in quite, uh, quite uh, impoverished soils. And the common blue that depends upon that as a food plant for the caterpillars, sadly, um, uh, wasn't able to survive long after the uh, plant disappeared. So quite a lot of plants have disappeared, but others have appeared, as you, as you, you shall see. Um, we have orchids on the Parkland Walk, or we had orchids on the Parkland Walk. Uh, this is the common spotted orchid, uh, which occurred in just one or two places on the walk. Uh, but now has disappeared. It, it, again, it's not able to cope with a great deal of competition. And we'll talk about competition shortly. In that 1982 survey, one of the most abundant plants all the way along the old railway was Rose Bay Willow Herb, as we can see here. It's a favorite flower of mine. It uh, was quite a rarity in Victorian times, but uh, it, it had, by the time I did my survey, become extremely common in London. And it is the food plant of a wonderful caterpillar. And there it is, that's the elephant hawk moth. All the hawk moths have this little hook at the end. And it has these eyes, and when it's threatened, it crouches uh, uh, down and, and, and threatens uh, uh, possible uh, uh, things that will eat it by flashing those eyes. So uh, just a little glimpse of some of the things which have gone. Those, those are native plants which can't cope with very much competition. So I then started to do as a second survey, and now we're coming up to 2015. And this is on the, uh, uh, between the two station platforms at Crouch End. And that's me doing a survey along the side here. What we do with by way of management, incidentally, is to cut one side one year, the other side the next year. So it's, it's, it, it, it never deteriorates for more than a, a, a year or, or, or gets better for more than a year. Uh, th this picture is to indicate various things. One of the various things it's trying to indicate, I don't know if you can see it, it's, it's hiding behind some by anchor, but this is a dog here. This is my dog, Blue, and I uh, used to, to, to bring Blue up onto the park and water. He loved it, um, but he's there for, for good reason because he demonstrates something I'll talk about in a moment. Bicyclists, they, they, they turned the Parkland Walk into a, a, a bicycle route rather to my uh, uh, anger because I, I tried to keep it as, as a walkway, but no, they said it has to be a, a cycleway. And I can understand the reasons for that, but I still felt rather sorry because you can walk along and suddenly get uh, frightened by a, a bicyclist whizzing past you. But Blue was important, and here he is in, in great detail, sadly no longer with us. Um, but he, he is there really to indicate that the park walks become a very favorite place for people to, to run their dogs, walk their dogs. And as a result, the, the soils have become um, a, a, a very uh, a rich. And that is not good news for things like clovers. So perhaps blue is to some extent responsible for the clovers disappearing. Uh, green alkanet. Uh, we move now from the native plants, which uh, were there right at the beginning, to uh, what I like to call exotics, aliens. Um, and there's a nice little uh, uh, um, comment that was made by um, Babington back in, the, in Victorian times, 1860. And he was talking about this plant. He wasn't very kind about it. He said that uh, in the floor of Cambridge, that a plant with uh, very slenderest or uh, perhaps no claim to a place in our flora. The Victorians disliked uh, exotics and aliens even more than many, 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 many people today seem to do. I'm quite fond of it, but it, it's certainly done very well in recent years. Um, and it's done well because it likes rich soils uh, and it's accompanied very often uh, by the uh, Japanese honeysuckle here, uh, which is much more frequent along the Parkland Walk than the native honeysuckle. And the uh, uh, Japanese species always has its, its, its flowers in pairs, as you can see here. Uh, the other plant, which interestingly uh, uh, has gone, although it is uh, another exotic, you might have expected it to have thrived. Uh, this is bladder senna. Um, and uh, it was grown quite often by uh, railway men in their gardens and it escaped. And it uh, was at one time abundant all the way along the park walk. So this got into my 1982 survey, but is now gone. So plants come and go, 
Um, Mats in the Belfry is the name that's applied to this, the nettle leaf bellflower. It's an interesting one because this is actually a, a, a rather local native plant, but it's one which does grow, is, is grown in gardens and often gets out. And that's what we're looking at here, an escaped uh, a bat in the belfry, if you like. The other plant which is constantly uh, uh, overlooked, I think, is this uh, holly. This is not the native holly, as you might expect. It's the high clare holly, uh, which again is widely grown in gardens, has very flat leaves, all the, the, uh, the, the, the spikes on the leaves point forwards. And uh, this is now uh, quite common along the Parkland Walk. Um, so you're getting this change from natives through to exotics, and in some cases, escaped natives. The, 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 this is um, the tree mallow, which I was very delighted and very surprised to find growing in several places on the Parkland Walk uh, in my second survey, the, the recent one in 2015. Uh, it's a native plant of, of, of the coast, but it's got into central London as well. Another garden plant, which is uh, abundant now on the Parkland Walk, is this form of the stinking iris, sometimes called a gladden. Um, and uh, this is a yellow form of the gladden. The type is nearly always much bluer than you've got here. This one has got a few veins of blue left there. Um, but only a few veins. So it's a, it's a different cultivar, and this was almost certainly escaped from a local garden as a consequence. The Parkland Walk, I showed you the old station platform at Crouch End, and this is a site where one of the most extraordinary native plants turned up, much to my surprise, uh, and it's a very beautiful plant. And here it is, um, and it's something that uh, I always, always uh, uh, forget the name of it. It's a, it's a cardamony. Um, Cardamony bulbifera, um, and uh, it, it, um, it turned up on the part of the walk again, greatly to my surprise, um, because it's not normally found in London, it's found on the Chilterns in one or two places, and indeed in Sussex, where I've seen it, but not normally in London. And it turns out, if we look at it a little bit more closely, the leaves are much more deeply incised than the, than the native plant. And this is a form, Tarmisifolia, it's called, in fact, that is occasionally grown in gardens, and it must have escaped onto the Parkland Walk from a garden. Uh, last few pictures. This is right up at the far end towards the Highgate tunnels. The tunnels are behind there and behind there, two tunnels. And this is a lady doing a butterfly transect walk. And growing amongst the vegetation here, there's lots of things that produce lots of nectar, lots of thistles, and other things that butterflies like. Um, so it's become, and it's a little hollow, it's, it's a cutting, if you like, and very protected from the wind. So it's a great place for butterflies. And one of the butterflies, uh, which uh, I was hoping to see there, feeds, the caterpillars feed on the flowers of the um, violet here, the, the early flowering uh, 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 dog violet. Uh, and sure enough, um, there have been records, and I was lucky enough to be able to get a picture of the butterfly in question, which is um, this one, the silver wash fritillary. This is the male with these very dark veins here. Um, so we have butterflies as well as flowers, and they all depend, of course, on the flora. Um, and th this is one of the, the geraniums, the, the meadow cranes bill, that apparently was deliberately planted. You have to be rather careful in London. You're never quite sure whether some things have been planted or whether they come in on their own. Well, the Islington section has a large colony of uh, meadow uh, species, and it's lovely to see it, and uh, uh, much more rarely seen, but occasionally found on the walk these days, is Tutson. And this is a plant which different uh, experts will tell you different stories about. Um, and uh, um, my, 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 my explanation for its presence on the Parkland Walk is that it has indeed escaped from a garden and they are occasionally grown in gardens, but uh, they also survive in seed banks and that is supposed to explain their presence in some of our ancient woods. And finally, uh, a last butterfly found on um, the, uh, 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 the, the uh, witch elm uh, and indeed elms in general, and the butterfly, which has become 
very scarce in parts of London, and I'm pleased to say that it still survives on the Parkman Walk, and that is the white letter hair streak. There it is. That is my last picture. Now, I think I have to do something clever now, and I'm not quite sure how to do it. If I, if I exit... Uh, and then if... Thanks, what, David. What and then you, if you can go oh, to the top stop, and stop do the share. Share. Do I hit stop share? Please, yeah, that's great. Yes, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. Thank you very much. It was lovely to see how the changes are with the years. And I love the way we got some butterflies as well as flowers as well. So that was great. Thank you very much, David. We're going Thank to you. we're going to save questions until the end. So if you do have some questions for David, just pop them in the chat. And we're going to go on now. Um, Mark, are you OK to start sharing your screen now? Perfect, thank you. Lovely. That's great. OK, I'm going to hand over now to Mark Spencer and he's going to do the next part of the presentation for you. Thank you. Ooh. Good evening, everybody. Um, this is um, a little bit of a whistle stop because naughty me, I nearly forgot about this. I, this afternoon, I was thinking I mustn't forget the LNHS meeting and then started pottering around in my allotment and uh, my brain <laughs> shut down. Typical me. Uh, Mark, <laughs> do, you, do you want to switch your video on, Mark? Have I not got my video on? Silly me. No, <laughs> ah, there can, we go. That'd be good. There yeah. we go. Forgot to switch on the video in, in, my, uh, in my chaos. There we go. All sorted. So uh, I'm like David, I'm going to be talking about um, a couple of pieces of survey work um, that I've been doing, actually, but all from last year, from 2020. Um, neither are in London because I've spent most of last year in isolation in the Isle of Wight or keeping away from humanity. Um, so the first set of slides I'm going to show you are actually from some field work I've been doing for Kent County Council um, down on the chalk of the North Kent Downs, um, where I've been looking at uh, some various pieces of chalk grassland that are in need of restoration work and identifying plants of interest for the area and then submitting the records to the local biological record centre with the aim of um, ensuring that they are looked after better into the future. And it's been very, very interesting and very enjoyable because we found some really rather significant records on one piece of chalkland, grassland in particular, which is not even listed as being of interest or relevance, but is undeniably ancient chalk grassland, one of our rarer and more vulnerable to loss habitats in this country. Um, so these first two images are of two plants which up until relatively recently were included in the Scrofulariaceae, the figworts, um, and they're both rather snapdragon-like plants, but neither are no longer, and neither are now in the Scrofulariaceae, because the Scrofulariaceae, because of us evil taxonomists, has got a lot smaller. It has shrunk um, to include Scrofularia, the Bascom and the Purple Peril Budlia. Um, so we now have a whole load of plants which have moved into different families. On the right here, we have um, yellow toad flax, Linaria vulgaris, which is now in the Veronicaceae. This is a relative of Speedwell's Veronica. So this and Snapdragon, one of its close relatives, Antirrhinum, are more closely related to speed whales and plantains of all things. People get quite surprised by the fact that plantain are related to these rather large jolly things, plantago. The main fundamental difference as to why they look so different is actually pollination syndrome. Plantago is primarily wind dispersed or sometimes small insects, whereas these attract larger insects. So the attractant mechanisms and the dispersal mechanisms are very different. So the dissimilarities are quite superficial. So next time you have a look at a plantago family flower, look at it more closely and you will notice it looks rather startlingly like a small brownie green Veronica flower. On the left, we have red barts here. 
Um, and this is still a pretty common plant in most of Britain, although it has certainly declined. Um, and this is a hemiparasite, which means it's semi-parasitic, and it has now been merged into the family Orobanchaceae, the Orobanchies, which are primarily totally parasitic, so they don't have any chlorophyll in their foliage, and their foliage is so redundant as to be reduced to scales. This one is a hemiparasite because it has some capacity to use its leaves for photosynthesis and augment its resources by nicking food off adjoining plants by sticking specialist stems called Horstoria into the roots of grasses and other plants around it. And we often hear about Rhinanthus yellow rattlers being a really good ecosystem regulator that's often used in grassland restoration. This species does much the same thing, but we never ever hear about it being talked about in landscape restoration. Um, this probably reflects the fact that in many ways some of our rewilding and you know restoration projects that are around this country are largely driven by expense. The things we put in the ground are the cheap and cheerful things, not the things that require a little bit of lateral thinking and resources. Next, oh, come on, there we go. Are we going to behave? Come on, my PowerPoint. Uh, we may have lost we Mark. Have, yeah, we seem to have. Let's give him a second to see if he can come back. Do, do we think if we've lost him from the meeting? Has he? Well, he's, his video is frozen. He's still appearing in the participants list, I think. Yeah, he's still here. Oh, he... but not here. But... <laughs> Schrodinger Mark. Oh. So we'll, we'll just give him a minute or so. What we can, we have, we've got a, somebody, a, a, um, George, George Hansom is going to do a presentation as well. So we, we, if we, if Mark doesn't come back, we can switch over to George. Do you want to sort of... Uh, yeah, Mark's, Mark's vanished now. So I think, George, can you... Okay, yeah. So let's go on to George. And then what we'll do, we can swap people around. And if we can get Mark back, we'll go on to his presentation after George. So are, are you okay, George, to step into the breach? Yeah, I can do that. Okay. All right. So share screen. And PowerPoint. Uh, do you want the uh, do you want to put um, to put your video on? Oh sorry, someone turned it someone's turned it off. Let me have a look. You should be able to. There we are. Is that all right? Yeah, we can see. Yep, we can see you now. And then if you do your share screen. Yeah, that was very strange. I just dropped out there. I wasn't quite <laughs> sure what's happening. Apologies okay, for hi. that. I'm hi again. Get back in. All right. So do you what we, we've just uh, OK. Do you think you'll be going to be OK to carry on? Right. I don't so know. I, I have no idea what happened right. then. According, okay. according to my computer, the bandwidth was fine. I, don't know what happened. Apologies right. for that. Okay, so Let's... George, George, if you yep. if you hang on again a minute, then we'll we'll have another go with with Mark. Is that all right? Thank yeah, you. Yeah, fine. Yeah, okay. All right. So, uh, um, Mark, if you want to carry on. Yeah. So sorry about that, everybody. Don't know what happened. Um, so this is still sticking with North Kent and talking about two plants, which um, one of which will be very familiar to you. On the left is chicory. Um, this is one of the, this country's most glorious, most beautiful and most easily recognisable plants because it's one of the few plants which has blue or blue toned flowers and is easily seen from a long distance. This is a member of the daisy family um, and is rather closely related to such things as lettuce. What I find extraordinary about this plant is that this plant is now listed as a risk of extinction in this country. So despite the fact it is still locally frequent, particularly in chalky areas, its populations has dropped quite significantly and its range has declined quite significantly. So this is a native plant which is still locally abundant, but if trends continue the way they are, we could lose this plant. 
on the right is an incredibly small and tiddly little plant which barely makes it into the good quality image front but it's really really interesting because I'd never seen it before until I did this survey and this is a valeriana but this isn't one of the more common valerianas which are the corn salads um, which you might see on occasion on kind of roadsides and pavements in Greater London, which is Valeriana carinata and Valeriana officin not officinalis, I forgot, yes, officinalis, Venaria nella, naughty me, put an ella on the end, that's Venaria nella. This is Valeria nella dentata. Um, and this is a much, much rarer plant. Again, this is at risk of extinction in the UK, although it is locally common in parts of Kent, in the North Kent Downs, where it is still doing quite well. Another plant which I turned up, and it's amazing how, you know, you can go out and find really large, blousy, obvious plants which have not been recorded. On the left hand side, we have clustered bellflower, Campanula glomerata. Now, Campanula glomerata is a classic axiophytal indicator of chalk grassland. If you find Campanula glomerata, you know you've got old landscape because it doesn't tend to move into new habitats very easily. Um, this plant is still locally frequent on the Chilterns and other parts and Wiltshire Downs in the past, but is strangely scarce in the North Kent Downs. We don't know why, because there's suitable habitat there, but it seems to be very, very restricted in North Kent. And um, this rather robust plant was actually from a completely new site that I discovered whilst doing this survey. In fact, I found three new sites for this in North Kent, which was very satisfying. On the right, we have another classic indicator of calcareous grassland. This is the carline thistle. Um, Carlina vulgaris. Carlina is quite a diverse genus when you get into the Mediterranean, but we only have this one species in Britain and Ireland. Um, it's a rather fantastic plant that often from a distance people think has died because of the curious browns and beiges and purple tones that the flower has. Wonderful, wonderful thing it is indeed. Now, I'm leaving Kent and I'm heading to where I am now, which is the Isle of Wight. Um, because I, I have a little abode here, which I hide from humanity in. And I've been very lucky to be doing some survey work for one of these terribly nouveau rewilding projects on the island. Um, and um, the Solent is quite severely impacted by um, nitrogen pollution from the adjoining urban areas, Portsmouth and the island towns as well as agricultural runoff, particularly with maize, because maize is being grown as a biofuel crop. Now, maize as a crop is ecologically and environmentally horrific under these conditions, because the runoff and pollutants from maize are something to behold. Um, so while on one level we are kind of benefiting from it as a biofuel, the damage that maize production does in these circumstances is quite severe. So the site I'm working on is actually a farm, a small farm, it's a couple of hundred acres, which um, has been used for maize production for several years, um, probably 10 years or so. And so you would expect under that regime that the biodiversity in the arable fields would be very, very poor. And it's been absolutely extraordinary. Um, when the uh, Wildlife Trust that I'm working with purchased the land through an agreement, and the ground had been the ground had been fallow for about six months. Um, the farmer had produced, ceased managing it in the previous autumn, and in that six months or so, um, an absolutely extraordinary diversity of arable plants um, have turned up on this site, which previously we'd have thought of was more or less ecologically barren for these kind of plants. Um, many of them are nationally common. Um, so quite a few kinopodium species and atriplex and a wide range of kind of common weedy things that you'd be familiar with in London, such as erigerans, the fleabanes. But there are also some really, really interesting plants. So on the left here, this is Filigo, Filigo vulgaris as was. We've gone back to recalling it once again, Filigo germanica, which is its old name. Now, this cudweed is 
not nationally endangered, but it's certainly uncommon over large chunks of the country and does appear to have gone through some regional declines, particularly in the London area. Curiously, in the London area, it seems to be rebounding, as is the case with so many of these annual Mediterranean ecosystem plants, because many of our arable weeds, as we sometimes refer to them, are essentially at the northern rim of their ecosystem, their original ecosystem, which was largely the Mediterranean region, because many of these plants are adapted and evolved to germinate and grow in the winter and spring, in the wet and cool, and then flower in the early summer before the summer heats. And Filago is a good example of this. On the right, I have a rather interesting viola because this is almost certainly, I need to really check it very carefully, viola contempta. And this is the hybrid between viola arvensis and viola tricolor, our two native widespread species of violet. Um, they can be quite tricky to separate, but Contempta is basically like a large version of Viola Arvensis. There were thousands and thousands and thousands of Viola Arvensis on the site, but I only found about three plants of Contempta. Unfortunately, we've not been able to find Viola tricolor, which is the rarer of the two native species and does appear to be going into quite significant decline. But I'm hoping further survey work may turn that plant up as well. This was one of the star shows for me because actually, um, bizarrely, this and another one which I'll be talking about, I'd never seen growing in the flesh in this country. And this little cheeky little euphorbia is euphorbia exigua and euphorbia exigua is known as the dwarf spurge this is a very large plant on the left hand side it was probably about 20 centimeters high the vast majority of the plants on the site were probably four or five centimeters at height at all it is generally quite a small plant um, and is highly restricted to the arable environment in this country and yet again, this is another species which is in quite significant decline and is really considered at risk of extinction in England. Here it is on the right with its rather extraordinary little um, flowers, which are not true flowers because these little structures in which the fruits are born are aggregates of flowers called cyathea. And they're really rather quite curious structures that do deserve a careful look with a hand lens. So I found hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these, which was deeply satisfying. Alongside really common plants such as this is Picris or rather Helminthotheca theca echioides, prickly ox tongue. This is an incredibly widespread plant, you know, and is one of the plants which is doing pretty well in the London area. Um, considering the challenges, um, but I just took a few photos of this because I just saw and then went, oh, look at those rather fantastic orange fruit, the achenes, which I'd just overlooked. It's those moments when you're doing something else that you kind of notice a plant in a different way that you've really not thought about it, so I'm so familiar with it. Um, it is one of these plants as part of these sort of yellow dandelion composites that many people get terrified of and can't identify. But always remember this one is incredibly easy because it has these huge bracts, five of them, that look a little bit like sepals wrapped around the flower head. There really isn't anything else like that in this country. Now, two more fabulous things. On the left, we have one of the Kixias. This is, um, oh, all of a sudden it's gone down to my Kixia sporia. We have two Kixias in Britain, uh, Kixia sporia and Kixia elatini. I found both species at the site. Now, these plants are not considered at risk of extinction in this country, but they're certainly considerably less common than they were uh, many decades ago nationally. Um, once more, I found hundreds of thousands of these plants on this site. It was absolutely jumping with Kixia. And as you can imagine by the form of the flower, this is a close relative of Linaria and Antirrhinum and Plantago. And another Euphorbia, which bizarrely I've never seen in the, fresh in the flesh in this country, this is Euphorbia platyphyllos. This is a larger, burlier, arable member of the Euphorbiaceae in this country, 
you sometimes can be make, mixed up with helioscopia, but once you've got used to the characters, it really is quite easy to separate. And we again, we found thousands and thousands of this scarce plant or pretty uncommon plant on this site. This is another example of kind of some of the rarities I was able to turn up. This is a tiny, tiny shot of a, a lovely, lovely Vicia craca in the front, the purple flowers, a member of the pea family. But the important plant is this Anthemis. This is one of the mayweed like plants. Um, this is Anthemis cochula, the stinking mayweed. And again, this and the other Anthemis, which are widespread in this country, which is Anthemis arvensis, are considered at risk of extinction um, in this country. This particular patch had millions of them on this site. I've never seen so much Anthemis cochula in all my life. It was so verdant, you could barely walk through it. It was so dense. It was an absolutely incredible sight and scent because it does have quite a distinctive niff. But the star of the show is this pick plant. It's a dreadful picture, unfortunately, um, but it really was something that um, it, I caused a bit of a hullabaloo because we'd actually got a couple of representatives from Natural England and the Wildlife Trust, and I was giving them a bit of a show and tell wandering around, going, oh, look, we found all these nice arable plants. And then it so often is the way somebody else was, who was about three metres away from me, went, what's this, Mark? Pointed down to the ground, and there in front of us was this which is critically endangered. This is Torilis arvensis, but this is the particularly fantastic form. This is the archaeophyte form because Torilis arvensis is a member of the carrot family. It's one of the hedge parsleys, um, comes in several species, and Torilis arvensis comes in two forms. The archaeophytic form, which means an ancient environment form, which is associated with old landscape and old arable practices, is short, fat and dumpy, to put it in crude terms. It rarely grows more than about a foot high. It's usually only a few, few inches, whereas the wild variant from more natural habitats, which isn't really found in this country, you find it in France, um, is tall and leggy, rather like our Torilis japonica. This is an incredibly important find because this plant is seriously at risk of extinction in this country and probably England and France has the majority, if not all of the world's population of this very, very vulnerable plant, which is a reflection of our ancient agricultural past. And just to show you another delightful little thing, this is a member of the pea family, naughty me, of the mint family. This is Stachys arvensis. And I put this up because this, this unlike the wonderful Torilus, is not very rare, but it just tells you something about the environment in, because most of the soils I were dealing with were on the base of the chalk slope in rather stiff clay that was broadly speaking neutral. But there were areas that were more acidic because Stachys arvensis prefers rather or slightly acidic soils compared to most of the other plants I've just been discussing. This was just one other curiosity of this site. This is a Hellenium. This is Elecampane. This is an ancient introduction that was brought in in the monastic period in this country. It's a non-native species. It's a scarce plant now that lurks occasionally in the countryside. I've only ever seen it twice growing wild in this, in this country. This was the second time again, just down the road from the survey area that we're working. And the other place was just around the corner from my mum's home in Northamptonshire. And just to finish off, let's get away from cold, gloomy, wet Britain with all its horrors and do a bit of Tropicana. Um, so before COVID erupted at such horrific level across the world, I was actually on a cruise ship in the Caribbean lecturing and talking about plants in the Caribbean, rather ironically about week and a half after we got off the ship, the ship got hit with COVID, so we were incredibly lucky. But beforehand, we got to see wonderful things like this. Some of those of you who are familiar with Caribbean plants might be quite familiar with this. This is one of the milkweeds. This is a relative of Stapelia. This is a non-native plant to the Caribbean. It was introduced from the old world, but is quite widespread in coastal areas in quite a few of the Caribbean islands and on the mainland.
This, on the other hand, is a native plant of the region. This is a mellow cactus. And these photographs were taken on one of my favorite islands in the Caribbean, the extraordinary, beautiful and fascinating island of Bonaire, which is semi-arid to desertic, unlike many of the other Caribbean islands that we think of, with um, th spiny scrubland and these wonderful cacti. This one on the left is a young representative of this species. And on the right, we have a mature plant. And this strange sort of dumpling gray structure on the top is a flower head because mellow cactus, which is actually interesting, was the first cactus introduced into Europe from the Americas after the great um, events of Columbus's arrival on, uh, on that, those continents. This is the first cactus that we saw in Europe. This strange head is produced produced and produces a flower head. These are all actually a persistent structure on the thing which where all the flowers are born out throughout the rest of the plant's life. So it's a very, very odd structure. A couple of other curiosities. Um, we're so used to looking at members of the dock family, you know, Rumex, and uh, thinking, oh, they're rather brown, drab creatures. But these are ones that kind of sort of rather blow your mind when you see them. On the, on the left, we have Antigonon. This is actually, in some parts of the world, an invasive species. This is like the sort of pink version of Japanese knotweed in subtropical and tropical parts of the world. Um, it's native to parts of the Caribbean region, but it's also been in Trisra. And on the right, the wonderful Coccoloba uvifera, uvifera meaning to bear grapes, because it has these grape-like fruits. Apparently they're edible, but I suspect they're rather underwhelming, with these wonderful broad shield sized leaves. The leaves can be about a foot across, they really are. And this is quite a tall shrub, small tree that you find growing in coastal areas. Other wonderful things you see in the tropics, which you don't see at home, is cauliflowery or cauliflory. This is the habit of producing flower spikes from your main stems or trunks. Such plants as cocoa, Theobroma cacao, and the wonderful calabash, Chrysentia, have this adaptation. And one of the main reasons they do this is either these are forest plants, and it can sometimes be quite hard to get access to flying pollinating insects. So if you have small flowers up the stem, they're often pollinated by things like beetles and ants that can climb up and down. So that is cauliflory. And my, yes, I think nearly my last was this thing. I was wildly excited by seeing this mad and glorious plant. This is a huge tree. This is Carupita guinensis. This is a close relative of the Brazil nut. And Carupita guinensis, these flowers are large. They're about this wide across. So There's a good couple of fists full. They're thick, fleshy, incredible things. This disc area is where the true stamens are, the male reproductive organs, the middle and is the disc. This mad sort of sea anemone-like thing down below is a false stamen structure. And it is designed to ensure that basically bats have to get their head in between this structure to get in to affect pollination. Really rather marvelous plants. And then just to end with this fabulous and glorious plant. This is a member of the pea family, quite widespread in the tropics as an ornamental plant. The powder puff plant is known, but I do like its Latin name because this means beautiful boys with a bloody head. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Mark. That's really great. Are you okay to stop um, sharing your screen now? Thank you. What a really that was a great variety. It was amazing. The plants at the end, the Caribbean plants, just amazing. But I, I thought it was really interesting the sites that you found and how you're finding new things in new places. So the, you've obviously had a really kind of quite an adventurous year, even though you've been not able to do you know a, a such exotic things as maybe the year before. I'm going to yeah. go straight over now to George Handsome, um, and we, if we were okay to start your presentation, George. And then we, we may run on very slightly today. I hope that's all right with everybody because George has got some lovely things to show as well. And then we'll just have a quick maybe question answer session at the end if anybody's got anything they'd like to ask. So as soon as you're ready, George, if you want to share. Share screen. Yep. And, um, uh, yeah. There we go.
And thanks for hanging on as well, George. I know you, <laughs> we, we, we were well, starting, but yeah, thank you. That's uh, really cool. No problem. Right, Sorry, this is... Yeah, you ready? Yeah, all ready. Can you hear me? We can hear you nicely. We, we can't see your screen yet. So do you want no. to just try sharing your screen again? Hang on. Yeah, it's coming, starting to come now. Oh, yes, we've got a... Uh, Oh, we've, got right. you, we've got you. We've got you. <laughs> that's my that's my wall that's my wallpaper. That wasn't in it, but that that's a, a, a lizard in Jersey. Wow, that's an amazing colour. Okay, yep. Now we've got your anyway, presentation. Um, and then wherever we want, yep, that's probably right. the best way. Yep. Okay, over All to right. you. Yep. Perfect. Well, I can't I can't match Mark's array of Caribbean colour, um, but I have a lot of British um, plants and and some insects as well. So there's a mixture of things. Um, everybody likes Ragged Robin, um, including me. And they're like, the petals are like five little men all with one head. And um, I always like to see it. Now, this was on a January day in the New Forest. And I, I rather like the look of the, um, of, the, uh, of the cut trunks. Does anybody know which tree it is? Um, it was easy. It's Douglas fir, and you can tell because I was in the middle of a Douglas fir plantation. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known. These are wood anemones, wood anemone vestal, which is a must be a sport. Um, this was taken in um, uh, St John's churchyard, and I saw it there when I first went about 25 years ago. And it's still there, um, hasn't got any, hasn't spread any further, um, but it's still doing well. And all these, the, this is a normal one, the stamens have been reduced to a sort of a petaloid appendage. Um, this is a normal one, except that it's rather, it's slightly pink, um, but you do get them. And I don't know what sort of spider that is, but if anybody does know, I'd be interested to hear. Right, spring. Um, on a sunny day in spring, colt's foot colours the waysides. I always like to see it because it makes me know that the winter's gone. And there it is close up. It's a member of the um, daisy family, the Asteraceae, with very narrow um, ray florets. And um, no leaves at this stage. That's just a stem with bracts on it. And in fruit, it looks like that. Um, I think plants and fruit are often ignored and neglected, but um, if you look closely, they're very attractive, as Mark's um, Helminthotheca demonstrated. Um, it's called colt's foot because the leaves are supposed to resemble a colt's foot. Um, do they? I don't know, but I thought I'd put in a picture of a colt's foot just so that you could see. And that's, that's a colt just after it's been born. And that's um, when, when one was a bit older. I didn't take these, I picked those from the internet. As you will see, I've had a few other pics from the internet um, later on. Um, the Latin name is Tuscalago farfara. Farfara means flowery. And it's because the underside of the leaves are covered with this um, very pale ingimentum. Right, roses. Um, this is a dog rose, one of the dog rose group. Um, you'll notice that there are no sepals. These are, this photograph was taken in October. You'll note that there are no sepals and the hips are pretty smooth. Um, and those are the prickles. They're not thorns. Thorns um, are like modified branches. Prickles are epidermal outgrowths, like the, an outgrowth from the skin of the twig. And these short, very broad-based uh, prickles are the ones of the dog rose. Now, walking down uh, Chantry Lane, 
near Shear with Caroline Bateman earlier this year. Sorry, not earlier this year. In the middle of last year, there was a rose in the hedge. And if you look closely, the hips are quite different. The petal, the, the sepals are still there. Um, the hips are covered with little glandular protrusions. And um, the, the glands extend all the way down the pedicels. This was soft downy rose. I sent a piece, I didn't, well, I, got, I didn't know what it was. In fact, I got the name wrong. Um, but I sent a piece to Roger Maskew, who's the BSBI ref, re referee for roses, and he named it for me. Um, the thing about this is you saw in the dog rose that the sepals fall off before the hips are right. In this, they persist. In fact, in the book, it says they persist until the hips rot. And there's a rotting hip, complete with sepals. And those are the prickles, very slender, and they're forwardly directed. That way is towards the end of the, the growing end of the stem. So they point the opposite way from the dog roses, which would have curved that way. And that's a distribution of the downy of Rosa mollis in the British Isles. It's very much a northern species. I think that record is from Robin Blades in Forty Hill or somewhere up in Enfield. And that cross is where, more or less, where Chantry Lane is near Shear. So it's an alien. How it got there, I have no idea. But there were three, three bushes in, not far from a house, but not obviously cultivated. And on it, there was a grey dagger caterpillar. I would have had, had no idea what it was, but I used um, Google pictures to search for the picture and it named it for me, which is very convenient. Right, I'm walking along near Thursley on the verge of the M3, sorry, not the M3, the A3, which you'd think was um, uh, pretty rubbishy grasslands. There were a colony of wax caps. Mark Spencer named them for me as Hybrocybe conica, and there were loads of them. Um, looking towards the center of the M3, I could see a spurge, so I went to have a look at it, and it was a patch of sun spurge. But with it was this pink thing. There's the M3, uh, sorry, the A3 going up towards Guildford. And it was a weasel snout, and I've never seen it there before. In, in that sort of um, habitat. Um, you have to be careful when crossing the, the central reservation of these roads, but there are quite long gaps and there was a double barrier, so it was, it was relatively safe. Um, it's called weasel snout because the fruits are supposed to resemble the snout of a weasel. Um, does it? I don't know, um, but you can judge for yourself. This is another picture from the internet. Right, waste ground near Bisley. This, this was wooded until a year or so ago. It was all cleared and then left. It was covered with all sorts of things. A lot of, mostly of garden origin, a lot of garden origin. Um, one of them was a marrow. And there it is, close up. We're all familiar with that. I went along a couple of months later and that was there. Uh, there were some other plants nearer, uh, nearer the path where the public go and um, all the marrows have been taken, but this one was in the middle of a tangle of brambles and nettles, so nobody would bother to go to get it. Well, no one knew it was there. And that's a melon, um, also a common, um, actually not a not so common plant of dumps. Um, di different shaped leaves and much smaller yellow flowers. Um, on a waste site near a building, um, over near Thorpe, I came across a uh, bladderketmia, hibiscus tronum. I've only seen it once before, uh, and in a similar, on a similar dump, the Trout Road dump at Uxbridge. Um, called the bladder, I suppose, refers to the fruit, which is like that, but what a ketmia is, I have no idea. Um, it's a, a bird seed alien from uh, Southern Europe. And nearby on the same site, the Solanum rostratum buffalo burr, which is um, 
in the, um, the, the nightshade family. And that's a typical flower and, and the burrs, the fruits are spiky like that. And it has a typical solanaceous um, inflorescence structure in that the flowers go off, alternate on, on the common axis and you get this regular branching pattern. Right, not far from where I live, there's a Christmas tree farm. I was peering over the fence when last July and I saw this thing and I had no idea what it was. I had to leap over the fence for a closer look and I could see it was a member of the Doc family. Um, various communications with Eric Clement and with um, Jeffrey Kitchener and John Ackroyd, the, ref the BSBI Rumix referees, and we decided it was Rumix thersiflorus. There's only one confirmed British record from Scotland um, about 10 years ago. Um, but the question is, how did it get there? Well, the Christmas tree farm, I don't know where it gets its stock, possibly from Poland, where this plant is a, a common roadside weed. Close up, it looks like that. This one was a female because this, this um, subgroup is dioecious and the stem leaves are very narrow um, with crinkly edges and very strongly sagitate. The, the, the bases have um, pointy bits which clasp the stem. So it's, it's quite distinctive. Um, I went along, I did buy my Christmas tree from there this year and you wouldn't recognize the place where this was growing. Um, it, was, it was completely cleared, um, but it's a perennial has a robust rootstock, and I'm going to go back along later in the year, and I hope it's still there. Another fairly frequent alien, a cotton thistle on a pollen acanthium. You can pick this out from 50 yards away if you drive past because it's large. And that's what it's like when it's flowering. Quite a nice, quite a stately plant, and that's a flower head called the cotton thistle. Um, my my first botany book is, calls it the Scotch thistle. I don't know why, because it doesn't grow in Scotland. In Surrey, it's scattered all over the place. And that's the sort of thing you distribution you might expect from a casual. Um, I did collect some seeds, so I'll grow it, but in fruit, it looks rather scruffy, so I, I, I might not bother. Right. Mark has several pictures of spurges. This is another spurge. Fairly common in, Lond in the London area, spotted spurge. It used to be um, a euphorbia, now a camisaisi. Um, this was taken on steps, I think, near the Tower of London. Um, I have, we have seen large patches of it here and there, but this is, a, this is on a curb side in Shearwater, not too, from where I, not too far from where I live. Exactly the same plant. However, in Gosport, John Norton saw, found this, which is camisaisi serpens, the matted sand, they call them sand mats in some other country. Um, and it looks different, paler green, no spots on the leaves, and the sathia have this white border. Right, square bashing. This is on a, I, I, I was in, intrigued by the habitat. It's actually um, a, a footbridge and, and ducting for pipe work crossing the M3 near Chertsey, and the gap between the pipes was stuffed with intermediate polypod, polypody, polypodium interjectum. And I like ferns. This is waru, common, but I like to see it. Um, in our area, it grows only on artificial habitats. This was on a wall in Cyan Park, and we saw it on the Thames side walk, of which more later, um, which was in a year ago, in, in January last year. Um, as I say, in the southeast, it's always on man-made um, substrates. This was in Dorset, though, and it's on, on it's in a limestone quarry on a natural substrate. And it's the first time, it's probably the closest area to London where it does occur on a natural substrate. When I put this picture up, I noticed these things. Uh, what are you then? Um, so I zoomed in. Sorry, it's so blurred. 
but how I seen them realize they were there when I took the picture, I've got to be a bit closer. It's a bristle tail, uh, possibly Dilta Israelis. But if you if you're on a beach and you pick up a stone, um, they leap all over the place. Uh, it's a type of springtail. And um, but this one wasn't on the coast, it wasn't on the beach. Um, it was there. There's the nearest, um, it's Kimmeridge Bay. So it's about um, a kilometre, something over a kilometre from the beach, which sort of makes it still for literalis. But, I, but I'm no um, expert in the, uh, in the spring tales, so if anybody knows better, I'd be glad to hear. Right, we're getting a bit away from plants now. I, I went to look for some hawkweeds on, um, at Box Hill on a damp, a damp June day, I think it was. There are a lot of these around there, and I couldn't resist taking a photograph. I think they're rather nice. I didn't eat it, in case you were wondering. That's its face. Marble white's there as well. Can't resist taking a picture of a marble white. This is a brimstone in the garden in July. Um, must have been a very, uh, they're single brooded. They must have hatched very early. But the, the color of the underside is very similar to the color of the leaves. So it will, it will it'll probably feed when it can, but hibernate until the following, until April this year, um, when, it will, uh, when it will be on the wing. Um, I like to think that this one might be in, still in the garden somewhere, hibernating in all the crud I have growing. Right. The, the plant is rosy garlic. This is in the garden. A crab spider and a bee. What I want to know is how does something that size, which must have small teeth, catch a big furry thing like that? How does it get its fangs? Into it to paralyze it, but it, it succeeded. And will it be able to eat it all? I don't know. Also in the garden, we have a, a colony of six spot burnets that has established itself. Um, it's one of these species um, of, of Lepidoptera that are increasing uh, over the past few years. This is on, it's on a French marigold. There were supposed to be dwarf marigolds. In fact, they grew to be, a, be, be about a metre high, so I don't know what happened there. But it's nice to see them. And the six-spot burnet liked it, and they are increasing. And this is why they're increasing. This was also in the garden. And <coughs> that's a, 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 actually, actually a fruiting head of, um, of meadow buttercup, ranunculus acris. But um, I should look out for my colony of six-spot burnets this year. I have a patch that I don't mow that's got... Uh, that's got the food plant in it, so um, I'm, op I'm optimistic. This is a hairy shield bug. Um, get, get quite a few bugs, but I've never noticed this one before on my, ooh, pardon me, it was growing on the on artichoke, globe artichoke. And my son-in-law, Pete, spotted this. I had no idea what it was. Um, it's a tanner beetle. And it's according to my insect book, it's scarce. It's stronghold is in the new forest. You get it elsewhere. I've never seen one before. I sent the picture to Stuart Cole and he named it for me. Um, I'm sorry it's a bit blurred, but it wouldn't keep still. And in the end, it flew off. Um, I keep a wood pile. That's, that's my house. I keep a wood pile just to, just to encourage anything that might want to eat it to eat it. And this is mainly apple and any odd bits I add to the top. But I'm a bit short of big bits these days. But something must be working because we get stag beetles in the garden. That's a female. That's a male. That's on one of the, one of the logs in the wood pile. We, they, we see them flying around in June. And then we find bits of them. And there he is again, face on, full face. And rose chaffers, Ceteria aurata, beautiful green iridescent beetles. 
And I have, when I, the, 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 the non-perennial weed garden waste, all the pruning things I shred and put in bags at the end of the garden and they lay their eggs in it. And I, often when I'm spreading the compost, I leave it for a year, <coughs> spread it on the garden. And often it's full of um, little white grubs. And I put them in another bag and hope for the best. But we still get these roast chaffers. So uh, some of them must survive. Right, back to plants, bluebells, the typical bluebell wood. We all know the English bluebell. And there it is. Um, a one-sided, secund, uh, inflorescence with very narrow flowers and the tips of the petals are curled over. They're very strongly reflexed. And the anthers are white. This is a hybrid bluebell. It's, a lot of people curse it. Um, it's all right, I suppose, in its place. Hyacinth thought is Prosmosatiana. The corolla is more bell shaped, campanulate, and the tips of the petals just turn outwards. They're not reflex worth speaking of. Its other parent, oh, sorry, and the anthers are very pale, very pale blue. Or, or sort of just off white. The other parent is a Spanish bluebell, which I hardly ever see. This was grown by a roadside near Perford. And the anthers are blue, even the ones that have dehissed. And the, the, the uh, corolla is much more open. Right, I've been singing the praises of this book recently, and I still do. Super book. I just put it up again so I could say how good it was. I'm sorry to say that the author has, has just died. Um, but this, I'm, I'm glad he managed to get this book out because it's a superb monument for him. This is... Sorry, George, I'm just going to let you know that if, if we, I, I mean, it's really, it's lovely. I know quite a lot of people have to go because they've got other meetings and things. So right. um, just, just to kind of let you know that maybe if we're sort of winding, <laughs> that would be great, actually. Thank you very much. People, a lot of people want to stay and but can't manage to. So um, just, I'll, I'm, I'll hand back to you, but if we're just sort of think, be aware that. How long have I got? Five minutes? Yeah, okay. okay. Okay, I'll go through it quickly. So on a rose side near Brookwood, quite a common one, this one. This is Horacium cantianum, very uncommon in uh, Surrey, and it's got um, yellow anthers. This was on a roadside near me. This is a garden escaped hawkweed, scotus sictum. Um, I can't remember where I took that, but it's got mottled leaves. Inspired by James uh, Heal's talk on gauze the other day. I hooked out a few of my photographs. This is on ash, Philopsis fraxini, it's a bug, and there is actually one on the on the on the gall. It's a that is rolls in the end of the leaves. Another one that used to be uncommon, which is much more frequent now, also caused by bugs on uh Santranthus rubi on red valerian. Again that rolls in the edge of the leaves. Um, one on willow, willow is a uh, favorite hosts for other species like oaks. This is a sawfly. If you take the top of one of those red things, there's a sawfly larva inside, poor thing. This is a, a fly, Rapalamaya tenacetifolia on tansy, produces these conical um, galls. This is on, believe it or not, this is gymnosporangii, the uh, gymnosporangium sabini, the um, European pear gall, you might think that's not a pear leaf, but it is. It's a uh, pyrus petulifolia, an introduction from China. This was taken in Holland Park. Uh, artichoke gall, a common uh, a, a gall wasp on oak. Um, Dipolithis nervova, uh, nervosa, a gall on um, another uh, a gall wasp on a rose. Two here together. But a hedgehog gall and Andricus aries, this little spiny thing, also on oak. Uh, Europhora cardioi, 
uh, on um, creeping thistle. I got that from the internet. That's what the parent fly looks like. Jar Piella Veronicae, very common on birds on, on, on uh, Veronica comedris, uh, bird's eye speed. Well, I put that in partly because it's I like it. It's fairly common and it's got two A's in the, in the name. Any word that. And that again, an internet picture, that's what it looks like. Um, deer grass on Chopham Common, lots of it. And there's a single tuft, quite attractive when it's in flower. Then it is close, there it is close up. Um, also on Chopham Common, on one of Paul Bartlett's meetings, you have to look at this little blue thing. And it's a marsh gentian, gentianella, gentiana numenanthi. There are a couple of colonies of it over there. I put this in up because we haven't any field meetings. Um, well, I haven't got any pictures of people. So this is from the one in January last year when we were walking along the Thames footpath on a particularly high tide, which I hadn't predicted. Um, and that's um, I think I think the bloke's name is Matthew, and this is Maureen Parry. Um, last slide: smiling face of what? It's a leaf scar of a walnut. Juglans Regia. That's it. <laughs> Thank you very much, George. That was a lovely talk to, as well to end on. And we got not only plants, but we got ghouls and we got quite a lot of entomology as well. So that was lovely. Thank well, you very much. I like Do to you, spread the interest. Yeah, it was excellent. Do you want to stop sharing your screen? Oh, yeah, sorry. Well, it's, uh... And then we can see everybody. Oh, hang on. There we are. Okay, so so we, we thank you ever so much to all three of you. There were very varied presentations and we had a really nice range just of amazing things, people exploring different sites, um, people really looking carefully at things perhaps we take for granted and then also finding things in all sorts of unexpected places. So that was fantastic. I hope everybody enjoyed themselves. We are running on quite late so I'm I think we may not have really have time for questions was there anything particularly David in the chat that um, we could pick up on or are we I, I think uh, no there, 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 there were a few comments but they weren't really questions they were just other interesting observations from people so I think that's yeah. okay so I think but yeah so I think basically everybody's kind of had a really lovely evening sitting back and just enjoying exploring all those wide, wide range of plants with some really good guides. So thank you ever so much to all three, to David Bevan, to Mark Spencer, and to George Hanson for really entertaining us extremely well. If you'd like to unmute yourselves and give people a clap, that would be great. I can see some lovely comments coming through in the chat. People say super presentations. Thank you very much. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. 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 Um, we'll see you again. We've got a talk next week, uh, a plant, uh, a, a bird talk, Steve Portugal talking about bird flight and cooperative aerodynamics. So please come along to that and please look out for all our other talks. You're most welcome to join us again very soon. Bye bye for bye. now. Thank you very much for coming. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. 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 Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye again. Bye bye. Nice to see you again. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Tschüss. <laughs>